<laughs> He's always doing that. Yeah. All right. Well, I'm good. You guys let me know we're speeding. All right. So I'll do a quick, a soft intro and then I'll, I'll cut to you. Yeah. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we are rolling into another episode of The Candace Owens Show, and I am so excited for the guest that is sitting across from me. You guys, I made history this year with the most watched C-SPAN clip online of all time. It was a moment of my House Judiciary Congressional uh, Committee hearing, which was on hate crimes, and the man who handed me the mic and gave me a couple of seconds to respond to Ted Lieu, Guy Reschenthaler. Welcome to the Candace Owens Show. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Did you ever think in a million years that you and I would make history together? I, who would have thought? You know, <laughs> and all I said was, do you want to explain what is going on here? I mean, that's it. That's all I said. <laughs> that's and you took said. it from there. I got all kind of credit for it. I did, z I did zero work on that. All I did is handed over it to you. Can so. I just tell you, I mean, I was sitting there and, and he goes on his little rant and he's painting me as unbelievably, as, as a Nazi sympathizer. And I'm going... Is this man trying to make America think that a black woman is a Nazi sympathizer? And then he says what he says, and he gives me no time to respond to him. So right at that moment, I'm sitting in the chair, and I'm just, I'm about to explode. I'm like, should I just get up and start screaming? No, 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 no. Stay calm, stay calm, stay rational. And I'm like, I'm not going to be able to respond. And then, ah, sunshine. It opens up. It, the clouds part, and a ray of sunshine comes into you, and you're just like, Miss Owens, would you like to say anything back? What were you thinking? Well, what were you thinking in that moment when he did that? Well, I thought it was, first of all, it was inherently unfair because the clip didn't show what led up to the clip. Right. And we don't have to relitigate off the clip, but, yeah. but it really painted you in a bad light without showing the entire context. So I don't like that, just picking and choosing um, you know, certain statements or without the context. Then also not allowing you to respond Ugh. was also inherently unfair. So I had my own questions for the panel, but after seeing something like that, I just felt like it would be a disservice to you and a disservice to other people in the hearing to not give you the chance to respond and also to correct the record with what actually happened in the entire clip. Right. And, and that's exactly how I was feeling. But let me tell you, when I walked out of there, I could have never predicted. I mean, what did you do when you went home? Was your phone just like exploding and you just see yourself everywhere? Right. Well, like you said, we made history. It was the most retweeted <laughs> clip uh, in C-SPAN history. And again, I got all this credit for it. I'm like, I didn't do anything. I just like Candace talk. So. <laughs> yeah. Well, that meant a lot in that moment. But I want to introduce you to my audiences, obviously, that may be naturally interested in you. And I did a lot of research. And I'm going to go ahead and say that you are a classic overachiever. Is that fair? Well, thanks. That's yeah. thanks. You do I quite a bit. It. It's, a, it's a lot to unpack. So you're from Pennsylvania. You've been yes. overachieving pretty much since you came out of the womb. And let's start, let's start with just your history in the Navy. Do you want to talk about what exactly exactly you did while you were in the Navy? Right. Well, uh, as, as you know, we're recording on 9-11 and I, I was impacted by 9-11. I always wanted to go into the, the Navy JAG Corps. I wanted to be a lawyer in the Navy ever since I was a little kid. But when I um, when 9-11 happened, I was a freshman in college and I knew that I, I definitely needed to not only go into the JAG Corps and follow that uh, goal, but I really wanted to deploy in the global war on terror. But uh, I finished. Um, I, I finished undergrad. Went right into graduated a year early because I was I was very excited to go into the Navy. And I figured I can do it, so I went to went to law school uh, a year a year earlier than most other people. And just from day one, I said I wanted to go into the JAG Corps. And the dean of the law school was actually the Navy JAG. He was the admiral of the JAG Corps who had gone to Duquesne. He was from Western Pennsylvania. Um, I believe he's actually born and raised in my district. Uh, in, in, what's my district now? But <clears throat> I. Uh, I was lucky I got into the JAG Corps. It was competitive to get in. And on day one, I said, hey, I want to go. I told my commanding officer I want to go to Iraq. That's where I want to deploy. Incredible. So, so a year – so I was um, – <clears throat> you had to wait about a year to deploy. So during that time, I was doing you know, wills, power of attorneys. And then I went to uh, – within a year, I went to Baghdad, Iraq. So I volunteered to do it, and I was at a I was stationed at a small forward operating base in Baghdad, right across from the U.S. Embassy. For anybody that's been to uh, Iraq, it was FOB Union Three. It's a pretty pretty famous uh, forward operating base in Baghdad. But in that position, I was prosecuting terrorists and insurgents in the Iraqi court system. So we would go into the red zone, into the Iraqi court system, although a very safe place of the red zone, but the Iraqis controlled it. And we would take terrorist insurgents in front of Iraqi judges. We'd use Iraqi law. We'd have an interpreter uh, and we would get uh, detention orders, which are conviction equivalents in their were you, system. Were you terrified? 
I, I wasn't, but I was also pretty young. Uh, right. So I was just excited to be there. Uh, and looking back, you know, at, at the time I was just so focused on the mission and right. it was amazing to be that, I think it was 25 or 26. I was fairly, I was definitely the youngest in, in our group that I was there with. It was a small group. Um, it was a very small unit. Uh, it was called Task Force 134. And we were the ones that were prosecuting the terrorists. But, you know, you're just in the moment. You're not thinking about anything. You're just, you're just, you're just prosecuting the terrorists. I've always, um, I've always found that mindset to be so interesting. So I was in third grade, uh, not third grade, actually, I was in sixth grade when 9-11 happened. Um, and I lived quite close to New York City. I was, uh, mm -hmm. I was raised in Stanford, Connecticut. And that mentality of some people, when you see something like that happen, a tragedy of that proportion, you're scared. Right, like for me, I was I was terrified. I'm right. not even going to pretend to be a tough girl. I was absolutely terrified. When I think of those people that are inspired mm -hmm. and say, "No, I want to go overseas," right? I want to fight. I mean, I really do believe that that means that you're made of something a little different. And and in this particular political climate, it's so interesting to see how we now have people that are hostile towards people that go out and they make these sacrifices and can't even imagine. I can't even imagine from from this safe spot, from this safe studio, from safe America, mm -hmm. um, having you know the will and the drive to go out and say, I'm going to go to Iraq, I'm going to go to Baghdad, um, and I'm going to go and, and take terrorists in their neighborhoods um, and try them. Well, you know, I was just, I was just so committed. So in 9-11, I was always, I always wanted to, like I said, I always wanted to be in the Navy, but 9-11 really made me committed to public service because you saw the nation rally. Um, you saw people coming together and, and you thought, you know, there's a threat out there that wants to harm the United States and wants to harm the Western world. So we've got to do something to pull together and, and combat that. So 9-11 has really impacted me from just my, my public service, right? I went right from the Navy, got out of the Navy. Um, was in private practice for a year and then was a district judge, state senator, and now I'm in Congress. So I'm really committed to public service largely because of what happened on 9-11, but also just on my outlook with, with the world. I'm very forward, forward leaning with foreign affairs. I'm on the foreign affairs committee. I, I strongly believe that we've got to be engaged with other countries. I think that we have to promote and defend other democracies around the world because if we don't, as, as we pull back, as America sits down, her enemies stand up. Mm -hmm. And we can't allow other democracies to, to fail. We can't allow them to fall because at the end of the day, those democracies are what give us our strength. It's our alliances. It's our alliances around the world. And it's our forward position being able to strike anywhere around the world whenever we're required to. So let me ask you a question. What's the worst thing you've seen overseas? The worst thing? Well, so I'm very fortunate. I was not in a combat role. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I was very lucky. But I had some great cases in, uh, in Iraq. I prosecuted roughly 100 terrorists. And um, in Iraq, you prosecute by the transaction, right? So here, usually you prosecute one defendant at a time. In Iraq, if you had three people that planted an IED, you, you tried all three of those together. So for example, I had a 15 co-defendant murder case. Wow. It was really bad. So what happened was we had a, a detention facility, theater internment facilities, what we called our POW camps. And the terrorists there were holding Sharia law court and they weren't allowing the other detainees, the other terrorists to smoke cigarettes, play soccer, um, listen to certain kind of music. And they were really creating havoc in the camps, but they sentenced my victim to death by beating and death by beating with the soles of your shoes, which is very disrespectful in their culture. So it was a horrific murder because it was torture, then he was beaten to death. So I prosecuted the 15 terrorists. Um, I got 13 death penalty convictions from that. And the ringleader was a really bad guy. He was more of a, um, like more of a criminal leader from Baghdad as a mm. terrorist. He wasn't really motivated by religion per se. He was just really a bad guy. Right. Uh, and I was able to get the death penalty on him, which I think it made Baghdad safer because he would not have been released into into the city right. when we uh, as we withdrew. So it'd be interesting to hear your perspective on how do you feel about the burning of the flag and, and now we're, which to me, it's funny that we're sitting here talking about 9-11 because I remember, and, and obviously I was young, but I remember these raw emotions and this feeling of togetherness in America after it, right? Right. Like there was no difference. I don't remember political party lines. It was just this mm -hmm. tremendous tragedy that affected all of us. And I remember right. crowding around the, the big screen TV. Remember you said the old school like giant ones that right, took up right. half the bedroom and watching every minute of the news and it felt like America was a family. Right. And now it seems like when we have moments of tragedy, whether they're on our soil or somewhere else, there's so much division. Mm -hmm. And I can't imagine that world that we were in 
being like it is today. Or I can't even wrap my head around somebody burning the American flag right. at a time like that. So what do you think well, has led to that change and how do you respond to it? Well, things are just so much polarized now. And, and I got to say, I mean, I, when 9-11 happened, I was a freshman. It was obviously it was September. So it was a freshman year, very new. So my experience with the political life before 9-11, not much there, right? I was a high school student that was just listening to talk radio, watching a little bit of Fox News. That's about it. Um, so, but I can tell you that we're much more polarized now than we were even when I was in college with yeah. um, everything that was going on, the protests against Bush and Cheney. I think that what's fueling a lot of it is social media. <clears throat> and one huge problem that we have with social media is algorithms feed what what you tend to listen to or watch, right? So if you get on YouTube, they know what you like and you'll get a video that comes up that you'll probably be interested. And that that's great because it's very efficient, but you get reinforced with your viewpoint. Mm. And that's leading to people going to news sources not to actually get information, but just to have confirmation in their own biases, right? And then they also, then people also think that everybody shares that viewpoint. Right. And if you don't share it, you're in a very small subsect and you're the problem in the United States. So I think that social media is, is fueling a lot of this. Um, and it's a problem. I try to get my news from a lot of different sources uh, because I want to see, one, I get the story, right? I know what's going, going on day to day, but two, I want to see how different outlets are, are portraying the same story. And it helps me get ready for committee meetings right because i kind of i know where the democrats are going to come come at an issue and it helps me question witnesses better helps me prepare my arguments better um i wish more people would do that because it would really be you know one has to sacrifice their principles but it would at least give you an understanding of where the other party is coming from and it would alleviate a lot of the tension and animosity right i mean it's hard to and i'll say this as someone that just had to sit through that the hearing that i was at and it's four hours long but it's almost like days of our lives. Like it almost feels like the ma the majority, maybe not even fair to say the majority, but there's just a big portion of people that are just buying for camera time now. And they're trying to see something that's so theatrical because they're looking for that 10 second moment that's going to be perpetuated on social media. They can then tweet. This almost seems to me now to be a layer, and maybe it, this is partly due to social media, but of narcissism Um, that's that's in our, it, it just here in, in DC. And it's hard for people to differentiate. And maybe, as I said, social media has contributed to that between their jobs and what they're actually supposed to do versus them just trying to say, I want to be the most known congressman on this committee. So I'm going to say something completely radical and weird as in, you know, Ted Lieu playing a clip. That's theatrical. I mean, that's completely theatrical. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Too many people are focused on how many retweets they're going to get rather than actually passing legislation. Right. I've got no problem being behind the scenes working on bills and, and actually getting things done rather than just seeing how many tweets I can get or if I can get on this news outlet tonight. And, um, and it's really a shame. The other thing is there's a perception in the public that the people that are always on the news are the ones that are always getting things done. It's oftentimes the opposite. Mm -hmm. the, the person that's not always on the news is usually the one behind the scenes that, that, that's actually getting bills passed, that's having amendments adopted um, or, or killing amendments, killing bad amendments or killing bad bills. Uh, so then that's just the nature of the system. But I think that we need to put a focus more on uh, procedure, getting things done, and just not on theatrics and politics. Yeah, absolutely. But you had a – you just got your first bill passed. Is that correct? Yeah, it is. I'm Let's thrilled. Let's talk about I'm that. Thrilled. Let's hear it. As a freshman congressman, that's a huge deal. Freshman congressman in the minority, so I'm thrilled that I got a bill passed. And I had a, a Democrat co-sponsor. Who was um, that? So it was Madeline Dean, and she is from also from Pennsylvania. But we were talking about, we were walking back to, we both live in the same apartment building. So really early on, we were walking back together, just talking about the transition. And she talked about this bill that she had an idea for, and it was to increase funding for local police for mental health issues. And she knew that when I, so she was in the state house, I was in the state Senate, and she knew that I worked on similar issues. Uh, so I said, this is something I'd really like to work on. So we got together, we refined it a little bit, but what it does is it gives, it, it increases funding for local police for uh, PTSD treatment, uh, depression treatment, and also, anti, or I was going to say anti-suicide, but suicide prevention. Mm -hmm. These, um, these police officers are all, they're all heroes. They keep us safe. We deserve, they deserve um, our attention and us to try to take care of them, help the situation. But their suicide rates are sometimes 50% more than the average public. Right. They also have, we've got to remember PTSD just doesn't happen in combat. They see horrific Crime scenes are dealing with a lot of domestic disputes that escalate. They're dealing, they're dealing with a lot. So they also need to have PTSD treatment 
as well. But I'm, I'm really excited because it really is going to help local law enforcement and hopefully it'll reduce the amount of suicides and other, wow. other, other issues. Wow. 50% higher? 50% higher. I they, did not know that. 50% higher in the police community. 50, so the police have a 50% higher chance of committing, committing suicide than pu the public at large. Wow. They, I forget, I think that's like three times more likely to die by suicide rather than in the line of fire or in the, in the wow. line of duty. Um, I forget the exact, but it, it's staggering, right? It's a big difference. Right. They're much more likely to die You don't die hear about that suicide. because at, right now we kind of have this public narrative that the police are the enemy. Um, so you would never hear right. something the, like this. So I, so I was a district judge for a period, a magisterial district judge for a period of time, and I worked with the police every day. And they, I mean, they have really tough jobs and people don't realize it. When that, when you get pulled over, you got to remember this guy has been working probably a long shift. He, he's under a lot of stress. He has just as much anxiety walking up to the door to tap on the window for your license or reg registration as you do. Cause he doesn't know what's going to happen when mm -hmm. you, when you roll down the window. So I, I think that people need to keep that in mind. They have to also keep in mind that they the police deserve extra attention because they're really working every day on their their own front lines right that's exactly right and i do a lot of work obviously just trying to change the narrative for a lot of reasons first and foremost because the narrative as it currently exists hurts everybody right mm -hmm. when you say you paint police officers as the enemy police officers are less inclined to do their job and that was proven mm -hmm. um after ferguson i mean the ferguson effect was essentially that homicide rates actually went up amongst particularly in the black community because they're so afraid of being called racist that they don't want to run in and do their job anymore um and and that's a narrative that really does need to be peeled back because across the board first off human beings are human beings across any field you're always going to find some bad eggs, right? right? And I say this to people, I say, did you know that a quarter of a million people die because of doctor mistakes, but we're not boycotting, protesting the doctors sure. because that would be stupid, right? It's the same thing with police, right? <laughs> you're always, the human beings are, are infallible. Like we're always going to have issues and people are not always are going to do the right thing, but we need to make sure that we're looking at it as uh, you know, the overarching opinion about what we're talking about when we talk about police officers and they do a very good job. And the second thing that's really important to talk about is particularly in these rough neighborhoods like uh, District 11 in Chicago, I actually went and met with the police officers and was shocked to discover that they were all black, <laughs> right? They were all black. Philadelphia, the police force, majority black, right? So when you make these areas super contentious, you're actually harming black men. The same people that you think that you're protesting to support, you're harming because it turns out that not all police officers are white. Right. And so... This is something that we have to do as an uphill climb. So what are some of the other issues that you are particularly involved in? Because you mentioned fracking to me on the way in. Well, so the natural gas industry is is huge in Pennsylvania, particularly in southwestern Pennsylvania. So I don't know if I mentioned this. I represent a district that's like a big U around the city of Pittsburgh. I'm right in the southwest pocket of Pennsylvania. But, the, um, but fracking and natural gas exploration has led to a big boom in jobs. And it's bringing back manufacturing. We, we got to understand that. What we, is fracking? <laughs> okay, so fracking. Let's, let's go all the way back. Someone watching this might be going, I don't even know what fracking is. Okay, so you have conventional wells, and that's when you go straight down vertically. Mm -hmm. Fracking is when you go down vertically, and then you slightly bend over a very, very long period or length, right? Sometimes miles, and you go horizontal, and then you use pressure to create cracks in the rock. And then those cracks release natural gas from the shell. And uh, there's there's various shells, but um, in, in Western Pennsylvania we have two different shells, right? Uh, some have estimated that there's more gas in that shell than Saudi Arabia has oil. Wow. Some think it's actually double, but we're talking about a massive amount of energy just in Pennsylvania. That's not even including New York, where unfortunately there's a fracking ban. Ohio and West Virginia. North Dakota and places out west, Texas also have it. But in Pennsylvania, you don't even have what's called a dry, um, a, a dry drill, meaning that you t sometimes you drill down and it's dry and you just write that off in the cost of energy production. Right. It doesn't exist in Pennsylvania, at least in southwestern Pennsylvania. It's not even factored in because we have so much natural gas. You right. know that where you drill, you're going to hit shell and get natural gas. But that's really, um, but that, that's fracking. Now, what, um, now and, what are the arguments against fracking? Well, a lot of, a lot of, we got to remember that about 20 years ago, natural gas was viewed as a clean energy. Environmentalists, environmentalists actually were promoting its use. As soon as it got big and started, as, as soon as we figured out that we could have uh, lateral drilling and, and get much more natural gas production than just conventional wells, then the environmentalists believed that, uh, that it was bad. 
It's not. One of the reasons why the United States has lowered our carbon emissions is because of natural gas. It just okay. burns a lot cleaner. But let me just back up briefly. We, we got to remember that the natural gas production we're seeing in Pennsylvania does two really big things. One, it deflates the cost of um, oil around the world. Right. And a, a lot of our enemies have oil. The OPEC nations, Venezuela, right? Um, if we are controlling our energy supply and we're exporting uh, energy, which we are now, we're in control abroad. It helps us geopolitically. Right. I, I really want to focus on this point because I've just really gotten into energy. I've just right. started really paying attention to energy and it is so important for people that are watching this show, for people that are in America to understand that you do not want to become an energy dependent nation. Nation, You do not want to be outsourcing your energy. You do not want to have to, to, to call a different country like Russia, which, you know, supplies a lot of energy throughout Europe because right. it creates a geopolitical mess. And, there are, and, and people do not understand how important energy is. Exactly. I couldn't have said it better. But if you just, if you look at Russia, because we can now export natural gas, liquefied natural gas from the port of Philadelphia to Gdansk, Poland, we can put Putin on his heels. We've also decreased that that what is essentially a petro state in Venezuela and Russia, and we've deflated their ability to um, uh, to fund opposition to the United States, to prop up in Venezuela's case a, a false economy, right. right? And we've exposed flaws in their communist um, economy. But it also gives us the ability to say to Eastern Europe in particular, if Putin is shutting off the the tap of energy, it's okay because we're going to be able to ship you LNGs right. from from Pennsylvania and from the rest of the United it States. It is a way to assert yourself as a power. And it's funny because so what I particularly got interested in this was kind of, I was just looking at Angela Merkel and I never know what side she's on. Like she says some statements sometimes. This was just, this is my own opinion obviously here. And I'm, I'm saying, why is she friendly to Russia but also wants to have allegiance with the West? Then somebody said to me, ah, Germany is, is dependent on Russia for energy. Right. So she literally, even if she thinks Putin is doing something terrible, she has to be very careful in how she deals with him because she relies on him. Which, which puts him in, in a position of power. And people don't realize that. So when you have these environmentalists running around to America saying, everything needs to be solar, we need to, we need to not do this, we need to not do that, and they don't have a viable solution, right? They're just saying, we don't like fracking. We, don't, we no longer like you know, natural gas. Right. They don't understand what you're basically saying is you want to put America into a position of submission against the rest of the world. You're putting us in a bad position. We, we have got to be, one, energy uh, independent. Okay, but two, we also have to be an energy exporter so we can help our allies abroad Correct. and weaken our enemies abroad. And again, a lot of our enemies have uh, oil. A lot of the OPEC countries have oil, Russia, Iran, uh, Venezuela, right? So we are now in a position of strength. But the other thing that natural gas does, it helps us keep our energy costs low. Mm -hmm. Uh, the average family in Pennsylvania has saved roughly $1,000 a year because of natural gas as opposed to paying for electric. Um, or because we're now using uh, natural gas for a lot of our electricity production. That's real money. That's real savings to an, to an average family. But just think about a manufacturing plant. Their biggest cost a lot of times besides labor and salary is energy. So if we can reduce the cost of energy, it's going to bring back more manufacturing jobs because it's just simply cheaper to produce goods. And this is always left out of the equation. And I'm, I'm trying to educate people on this, but it's just not about energy production. It's about the petrochemicals that come from natural gas. Uh, so, so that the guy in my office that's protesting my position on being pro-natural gas, I can guarantee you that the, the vegan protein bar that he bought, he got at uh, REI came in a wrapper that was made from petrochemicals, right? So like funny. the sandals he has on probably coated with a petrochemical that came from natural gas. Right. People just don't realize uh, the extent of it. I've got uh, a business right around my district called Covestro and they do coatings for surfaces. You cannot get within three feet of a product that wasn't either developed, uh, created, or manufactured by uh, Covestro. Because it, because we have petrochemicals everywhere. So right. that puts it in perspective. So it's the byproducts and everyone's using them. Absolutely. And yet you think the vegan protesters like, well, I'm, you know. They focus just solely on energy. Right. You could, we could have 100% energy from solar, okay? We would still need, pet, we'd still need natural gas for our petrochemicals. Right. But the other thing it does is when, when we have natural gas here and we, we're getting those petrochemicals and we don't have to export them from abroad, or in our case, we don't have to import them from Texas, let's say. We not only have cheaper petrochemicals, we don't have transportation costs with them, and we have lower energy costs. 
So we're, we're on the verge of a huge manufacturing boom in Western Pennsylvania, what we would call in Pittsburgh a fourth renaissance. Right. So what I normally say to people when you're talking about all of this stuff is you can sound really friendly and you can talk about environmentalism and you can talk about uh, being a vegan and how it's going to be better for the world. I just want you to know that the East doesn't care, right? So if you say we're not going to make the product because it's polluting the air, China will. Right, <laughs> well, Russia will. So that's another great point. Um, China's I, the I biggest look, pollutant. They're the biggest pollutants. I mean, if you incredible. combined, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, if you combined the United States and all of Europe, you would not get the carbon emissions that just China puts out into the world. And they yeah. were never even in on the Paris Accord Agreement, the climate agreement. So it's worth the piece right. of paper that it's written on. Right. If China's not playing the game, it doesn't matter what your opinions are. Exactly. And if you look at the Paris um, Accords, we're the actually the only country there that's reduced our carbon emissions. Saw that. And we've done, yeah. And so it doesn't matter if we signed on that or not. That really would have inflicted a lot of pain on our economy. Mm -hmm. uh, China, well, I believe, was exempt until 2030. A lot of the other countries were exempt for periods of time. They, that was just a symbolic gesture for it them. It was. It wouldn't have been a symbolic gesture for us. It would have created havoc on our economy. And Trillions. again, just take it. We're, we're the ones that are actually reducing our, our um, carbon emissions. I, I agree. But I also need to talk about. Measure. But I also, you brought up a good point that's better for us to consume the energy here. Think about coal. Coal always gets a bad name. I've got a lot of coal in my in my district, and we need it for metal, metallurgical purposes too. But let's just say energy. It's actually better for us to burn the coal here in the United States because we have scrubbers and it's relatively clean. If we ship that to what India, what do you mean you have scrubbers? I'm not that familiar. Yeah, so when you're producing, let's say you're using, you're burning coal or you're producing steel, mm -hmm. whatever, any kind of manufacturing or energy production, you have steamers, you have scrubbers rather. So it's coming up like steam, right? Mm -hmm. And you, you can scrub the chemicals out. Okay. Okay. So you can go into like a manufacturing plant. They'll have scrubbers. And the EPA and the DEPs and states have certain regulation on how um, how much that the, the air has to be scrubbed before it goes into the ambient air right outside. India doesn't have those standards, right? China may not even use their scrubbers, or if they do, they'll turn them off because it makes it very expensive to produce energy. So it's better for us to burn and use the coal here because we know the EPA and the DEP in whatever state is enforcing the scrubbers. That's exactly so right. So it's cleaner. So it's very sad. The other point is a lot of the people that are against natural gas production, they don't understand the economic havoc it's, re it's, it's having on those who are low income. I'll use New England for a, good for a great example. They're paying a lot of money in those cold winters to heat their homes, right? And they're getting their natural gas and energy from Russia because New York has banned fracking. They've also banned the ability for Pennsylvania to have a pipeline going through New York and into New England states. Right. So there's a huge economic toll that's being taken by really the most economically vulnerable to get hit with this the hardest. And also you're strengthening an adversary that we have and you're making you're making families in New England dependent on Russia and this rather is what than I say on to neighbors. People, they and, need to understand the East doesn't care. So they, they'll right. do it. So you saying you're gonna ban it here doesn't mean that they're gonna ban it over there in the East. And that's exactly right. It just harms us. Right. And 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 it's so hard to get people to understand this because there's this feel-good mentality, right? I stopped the pipeline for going through, but you, you know what you also stopped? You also stopped this family from for being able to heat their own home at an economical right. price. You also have killed a lot of jobs. We've got a um, cracker plant coming into Western Pennsylvania, we're talking about exponential job growth and really good jobs. You're talking about jobs, carpenters, steam fitters, operating engineers, right? Jobs that, that are skilled that don't require college education, yet you can, you can raise a family on that, you're getting a higher wage. They're killing those kind of jobs when they try to shut down a cracker plant or shut a pipeline mm -hmm. down. Luckily, people low in Pennsylvania- wage, low skill, you know, jobs and job well, opportunities. Well, well, they, well, these jobs are not low wage. They're, they're um, I mean, you're talking about folks that go to a trade school that are, um, they're steam fitters, carpenters, plumbers, oh, right? Oh, right. Those that, are- That are, their skill positions and the wages are very, actually very high. And the other thing, they don't, people go into these fields. They're usually getting paid when they're studying, right? And they're working as apprentices and they're not delaying going into the workforce by four or five years. They don't have to take out $100,000 in they're student not taking loans out debt. like I did. Right. So right. not only are they not taking out debt, they're getting paid to get educated. They're working while they're educated. And those four or five years when most people are in college, they're being productive and they're earners during that year. And when they get out, they're making very high uh, wages. I right. mean, we're talking $70,000, $80,000 a year, not including overtime. I can guarantee you that uh, a well-employed steam fitter, plumber, 
uh, operating engineer is probably making much more than a first or second year attorney. Oh, they make they make an absolute killing. I know this because I had a house and and uh, in Connecticut. And when that heat went out in a in a cold winter day, the amount that I got charged to get that man to come into the house, and he's like, "Well, who else are you going to call? You're going to turn the heat on." And he was a- absolutely right. You know what I'm saying? And right. and this is sort of when I was saying to you when you walked in that we need to start encouraging students to pursue these paths. Like there's something suddenly wrong with trade schools, or absolutely. wrong with being a plumber, or wrong with being the guy that can fix the air conditioning. Um, don't take out student loans if you don't know what you want to do and you're great with working with your hands. Figure that stuff out so that the people like me who go take out a hundred thousand dollars in student loan debt, but can't can't figure out how to fix the toilet. You know what I mean? Right, right. Well, also, you, you're never going to be able to outsource a plumber, right? right? You know those jobs are going to be around. They pay pay a lot. But we do need a paradigm shift with education. Mm-hmm. I think I worked on a lot of this as a state senator. Unfortunately, uh, we weren't able to get a lot done just because the mentality is so set with people going to four-year degrees. But these high schools are ranked by not how many people finish a college, not by how many people were employed at, after a certain period of years after they graduate high school. Their ranks by how many of their graduating class goes to a four-year degree program, it's right? So that incentivizes the school and the guidance counselors to push everybody into, into a four-year degree program. And that's not right for everybody. Um, and so that's a problem. We also have got to do something with um, just – just the truth in lending, right? So we have a truth in lending act. When you buy a car, when you buy a house, you know, the amount of payments, you know, the APR on it, you know, how long it's going to cost month to month and how long you're going to have to pay it back. There's nothing like that uh, for colleges. So you have these kids that are 16, 17, looking at schools or 18 or 17 when they're going to college, taking out sometimes a hundred thousand dollars of loan, clueless on how much they're going to make. Um, they're really being taken advantage of. That was if- me. I took journalism as a major. Um, I came from a, you know a family that didn't have an educational background. My mom didn't graduate high school. My dad never went to college. My dad was a plumber, um, I, ironically. Um, and when you come from that background, your parents don't really understand all this stuff, all the paperwork that's coming through the household. Right. You sign up because you're scared. To, you feel like you have to go to school. You're not going to have a life because of that pressure from the guidance counselors, the teachers, the schools, uh, the entire school system from the time that you can speak or do everything you're doing is to go towards college, college, right. college, university. And that does sort of need to be transformed from the inside out. Right. But I think that, so as a conservative, I always want to empower the individual and empower the consumer. I think we do it by requiring a Truth and Lending Act style disclosure for students coming into college. Right. Right. And now they, they, they can see if they're going to major in uh, literature, right? They might only be making twenty or thirty thousand, and they might be working at Starbucks, right? Whereas if they go into accounting or another hard skill job, they'll be making certain more. And also, they can look at trade schools and see how much they're making. But also, they need to know how much the loans are actually going to cost, the interest rate, and their their um the length of time it's going to take to pay that back. If we required colleges and universities to do this, the marketplace, I think, would correct itself because people, once they are given that information, will shop around and they'll make more financially sound decisions. Right. I absolutely agree. I want to pivot here and get back to China because um, you just told me that you recently met with Carrie Lam uh, of Hong Kong and all of these, these crazy protests that are going on right now. And they're waving American flags and they're saying, Trump, come here and fix, uh, fix what's happening in, in Hong Kong. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I'd love to. I was in China um, in March, the time frame. I was with a bipartisan delegation, and we went to we went to Hong Kong first. We then went to um, we went to Beijing after, and Hangzhou as well. Hangzhou is like their Seattle. It's the, the, the hub of their technology. Yeah, I've been there. But, okay, so we went over. I thought I'd come back maybe softer on China. I didn't. I came back as even more hawkish than I was before on China. They're a real threat. But what they're doing to Hong Kong should alert and scare all of us, right? So Hong Kong is really an independent enclave, an independent super city state, if you will. And they have the British common law. They have a freer economy than the United States, one of the freest economies in the world. They have rule of law, political parties. They have um, proportional representation and elect, elected Nothing government. Nothing like China. Totally different. They are a part of the British Empire forever, and that you see that influence. They are the West. The, I mean, it's, right. they're the West and the East, if you will. Right. The Brits were there for something like 100 years. Right. There's Until been a, when was it? 1970? 1997 was, I believe, 97 was when the Brits handed it back over. Back over. And there was an agreement called the Basic Law. And it says that the Hong Kong the Hong Kongers consider themselves Hong Kongers. They don't consider themselves Chinese. Right. 
And the Hong Kongers have the right of autonomous rule for at least 50 years. After that 50 years, it's very murky. And I think a lot of this angst is coming from that. But mm. they get to retain their judiciary, their independent judiciary, and so forth. What's, the other interesting thing, I just got to point this out, is they're so committed to the common law and to rights that they have rotating judges from other Commonwealth uh, nations. So on their Supreme Court, there's always at least one or two designated spots for somebody from Great Britain or Australia, New oh, Zealand, wow. Canada. I because didn't know they, that. Yes, because they want to keep tied into the common law system. They're that committed to it. And the business community is very focused on that because it's, of course, brought a lot of prosperity, a lot of predictability in the markets and personal freedom and liberty. But what's happening is the Chinese wanted to have an extradition agreement where they could come in and um, take Hong Kongers to mainland China for trial. Well, the Hong Kongers don't want that because they they want the, uh, the rights. They want to know what they're charged with. They want to know that they're going to have a fair trial. There's none of that in mainland China. And it would they know also that. harm business. I mean, people that are going to Hong Kong for business and then risking being extradited to China for something, I mean, it, it impacts them in a, a variety of different ways. Absolutely. It would, it would, so it hurt their economy, but it would also chill their ability to speak out because as soon as you had somebody that was critical of mainland china mm. then they're being extradited to mainland china and they probably will not be heard from again mm -hmm. so the hong kongers knew that would be the first step toward just totally decapitating freedom in hong kong so they protested and it started with the umbrella protest they were called the umbrella protest because they used umbrellas to block tear gas and whatnot from uh, from the authorities there. But then it's morphed into something else. And even though the extradition has been taken off the table by Carrie Lam, who's the chief executive there, that would basically be like a governor, or a mayor in their system. And, the, and she's elected by their council, by their legislative body. She's not popularly, popularly elected. Even though extradition is off the table, the Hong Kongers still want other reforms. They want to be able to elect the chief executive, not from the council, but through uh, through the people, right. right? And that would probably get something that's much more pro Hong Kong independence, and I can talk about that. Um, so they, there's other reforms out there that the Hong Kongers want right. to bolster themselves against mainland China. Right, and the extradition thing, I mean, it was taken off the table for now, by the way. This wasn't like we're never going to come back to this. This was sort of a, you guys are acting up right now, so we're going to table this discussion for later. And I think that maybe it is that 50-year rundown that's got them feeling a lot of angst about it. The Chinese can wait out the Hong Kongers and they can wait us out. We got to remember what's going on in the whole context of China right now. They're in a fierce trade war with, with the United States. Right. So by, by taking pressure off the Hong Kong situation, it gives them more ability to focus on the trade war against us. Mm. So don't think that these two things are independent. Once this trade war is either won or lost and the Chinese can refocus on Hong Kong, they're going to do it because they want a truly unified China from their viewpoint. That means Hong Kong uh, with, within mainland China, get rid of the one country, two systems, which is what it's uh, which is basically the basic law. They also want Taiwan back, and they're right. they're they're marching toward that to have a totally re what they view as a reunified China. Right, exactly. Well, actually, this is this might be a bit of an ignorant question, but I can't seem to figure out what do we view Taiwan as. We do. Okay. So, so we, yeah. So we've we've made commitments to Taiwan that we'll defend them. Taiwan is is a democratic state. Right. Um. We we have strong relations with. Because China with, always gets super upset whenever we say you know acknowledge Taiwan. And I'm like, do we legally acknowledge Taiwan, or we, do we just we sort of work with we them? We acknowledge Taiwan, but you got to remember what the Chinese are doing. The Chinese, if you're a company and you list Taiwan as a is another country on your website, for example, mm -hmm. when you scroll down to pick your na your, your nationality. They'll cut off relations with that company. Very the Chinese consider them part of the mainland. Right. And but Ta Taiwan, what happened was when the Nationalist Army with Chiang Kai Shek was defeated, they retreated to Taiwan. Right. And Taiwan fluctuated in control historically between the Japanese and the, the Chinese. It was passed back and forth. But that's where Chiang Kai-shek went, went with his army, and then they became a democratic state. Right. Right. And, and China went the way of communism with Mao, of course, because he won the war. But it's a point of contention for them that for them to retake Taiwan. Right. What's your goal? You know, I'm just ha I just want to pass good legislation. I want to have good relationships with my fellow uh, members of Congress and, and the U.S. Senate and good uh, good constituent services back home in the district. And I just want to I want to, of course, advance the conservative agenda. That's why I got into politics uh, to begin with. But I just want to get things done that are good for the economy, good for the people of my district in the United States. What's your 10 year goal? It's, if you would have told me, if you would have told me when I was 29 running for magisterial district judge, 
that I'd be in Congress within a few years, I would not have been able to believe you. Right. Uh, I really, everybody always thinks I have this plan or I've planned this out. That's nonsense. No, I don't think you've planned it out, no, but you've, you've I, got a lot of potential. Well, yeah. thanks. I appreciate <laughs> that. I just, I try to focus on the here and now, try to do the best job I can. Just like when I was in the Navy, I never really put too much thought of where I'd be assigned next or what my next case was gonna, what the next case would be assigned to me. I just said, I need to do the best I can do right now, wh whether I'm at this duty station or I have this case assigned to me, then I'll figure things out as we go. But it, they, I'd be perfectly happy staying in Congress and just working on good legislation, getting bills passed and slowly over time, advancing the conservative agenda. Mm, I think you've got, I think you've got a little more on the horizon. I, I, I think so. I think you'll get bored of Congress after a while and you'll be able to affect change in other ways as well. No, no. I, I can tell you one of the reasons I really like politics in general at whatever um, level, but it's especially at the state Senate level and the congressional level, it's multifaceted. You can never get bored in this position. I mean, think about it. You have um, just the campaign side of this, right? I, I really like to get into how, how we buy media, how we use that. You get into fundraising on one side, um, how you help others um, win elections. So there's that side of it. Then there's the policy side, which uh, I try not to be wonky, but you can probably tell from this conversation, I love policy. Right. And you can take deep dives and whatever. I'm lucky I'm on foreign affairs, which is a passion of mine, and I'm on judiciary, which is another passion of mine and fits into my background. But there's always bills you can work on with energy production, within the healthcare industry, with with um, immigration does fall under judiciary, but there's tons of issues that you can get behind and become expert, like a resident expert in. And, and then there's there's everything on going on back home. So it's truly multifaceted. If you're getting bored, it's because of you, not the job. This yeah. job can be as challenging as you want it to be, uh, as long as you come at it with intellectual curiosity. Well, that is a wonderful place to end this at. But we end every single episode with allowing my guests to look at that camera, and okay. you're going to leave a two minute uh, video message for the world. And okay. just so you know, every person in the world watches the Candace Owens show. <laughs> of That's course, a fact. Everyone, exactly. Guys. So two minutes on the clock. On your mark, get set. World, I give you Guy Rushenthaler. Well, world, thank you, and uh, Candace, thanks for having me on. You know, I think that what we've got to do is we've got to be committed to. Um, free market economics, because that is what really brings peace and prosperity around the world. So if you're listening and you're not in the United States, know that if you stand for freedom, then the United States stands with you. Thank you. That wasn't two minutes, but it we'll let you wrap it, it went that by that now. It went by pretty quick. No. <laughs> Should we reenact Congress? Right. <laughs> no, that'll take two and a half hours. Right, right. <laughs> Thank you guys for watching the latest episode of The Candace Owens Show. I hope you guys enjoyed the conversation as much as I did. As many of you guys already know, PragerU is a 501c3 nonprofit organization, which means we need your help to keep all of our content free to the public. Please consider making a tax-deductible donation today. I would really appreciate your support.